Good evening, y'all. I told them I have to go after Alejandria. All right, uh, first of all, I'm glad that we have some folks here from New Orleans. Thank you to New Orleans for hosting us. Who's here from Texas? If you'll notice, the Texans in the room have a big smile on their face because they know that in a couple of months we're going to have a new senator when Beto O'Rourke beats Ted Cruz. I have a twin brother, Joaquin, and uh, Joaquin represents San Antonio in Congress. And Joaquin likes to go around telling people that the way to tell us apart is that I am a minute uglier than he is. <laughs> when I was serving President Obama in the cabinet, I used to tell folks that the real way to tell us apart is, was that we both lived in Washington, D.C., but he was in Congress, so I was the only one that actually worked in Washington, D.C. <laughs> but don't worry. When it changes hands in November, we're going to change that, and Congress is going to get working again for the American people. <laughs> Netroots has a rich and proud history of gathering some of the nation's leading progressives. As progressives, you believe in investing in the people of America to make progress. I'm excited to be here tonight because in my own life, I have been a beneficiary of that progress. Joaquin and I grew up on the west side of San Antonio with my mother and my grandmother. My grandmother had come from Mexico when she was six or seven years old because her parents had passed away. And she came to San Antonio to live with her closest relatives. They pulled her out of school before she finished elementary. And because of that, she worked her entire life as a maid, a cook, and a babysitter. She raised my mother as a single parent, and my mother was the first in her family to graduate from high school and then go on to college, and she became a hellraiser. She was a Chicana activist that was part of the old Chicano movement of the late 1960s and early 1970s. And I can remember on April 3rd, 1992, running out to the mailbox with my brother. We were growing up on the west side of the city, going to the public schools of San Antonio, and. We had gotten the U.S. News and World Report that ranks all of the colleges the fall before. And we got fee waivers and we applied to college. And on that day, April 3rd, we ran out to the mailbox and we found in the mailbox these two packets. And y'all may remember when you're applying to college that you wanted it to be a packet and not a letter. Because if it was a letter, it was probably a thanks but no thanks. We took those packets inside and with my mother and my grandmother around, we opened them up, and the letter inside the packet said, congratulations, and welcome to the Stanford class of 1996. And, you know, I wish that back then I had had one of the cell phone cameras that we all have now, so that I could have taken a picture of my grandmother's face because she never could have imagined that kind of opportunity available for herself or for her daughter or even for us. It was one of those moments in life, and I'm sure that y'all have had them, where you're so happy and you feel like your dreams are coming true. And then a couple of weeks later, we got the bill. <laughs> and that wasn't such a happy day. At the time, that university cost between $27,000 and $28,000 per person per year. And the year that we applied, my mother had made just under $20,000, and my grandmother was getting a few hundred dollars in a Social Security check. And so there was no way that these two women that had worked hard their entire lives could afford that kind of opportunity for Joaquin and for me. And the only reason that I can stand here in front of you with the benefit of a good education is, of course, that I worked hard and my family worked hard, but also because there were Pell Grants and Perkins loans and there was federal work study. And I believe that this country has been greatest when it invests in real, meaningful opportunity for everyone, no matter the color of your skin or where you live or how much money your family makes or doesn't make. Everybody should be included in the United States. And the thing is that we face a, que a question in our country today. 
as we sit here in 2018. And the question is, what does progress in this 21st century require? We need a 21st century blueprint for progress. That means investing in universal pre-K and in free public college because brain power is the new currency of success in the 21st century global economy. And we need to be the smartest nation in the world, the most skilled. It means health care that is universal by right so that every single person in this country can get good health care. It means ensuring that we protect a woman's right to choose so they can control their own bodies. It means that we overturn Citizens United and get big money out of politics and put the redistricting power into the hands of the people instead of the politicians so that we can get more unity in our country. It means that we raise the minimum wage so that people can afford the rent and don't have to work two or three jobs just to put food on the table for their family. And it also means that no one is above the law. Not the President of the United States and not law enforcement officers who too often brutalize young black men and young black women in this country. You see, as progressives, we're not interested in making our country anything again. We're not looking backward. We're looking to the future. We're interested in the years to come in making America better than it ever has been and including everybody in that prosperity. And we know that progress is tough that progress takes all hands on deck. When my mother was 23 in 1971, she ran for the San Antonio City Council with a slate called the Committee for Body Betterment. And the slate was an independent group that was trying to close the opportunity gap that existed on the west, south, and east sides of San Antonio, mostly black and Latino neighborhoods. None of the candidates of the slate won. They didn't have single member districts, and at the time, very few women and very few minorities won those races. And on the night that she lost, on April 6th of that year, she told a local reporter when they asked about the future, she said, we'll be back. And 30 years later, in 2001, when I was 26, I got elected to the San Antonio City Council because of the work of my mother and a generation of activists and the progress that that generation helped make possible in the United States of America and in cities like San Antonio. And that was the kind of progress that you have worked on for a long time, that all of us have been beneficiaries of. And so we know that change does happen, that sometimes progress takes time but it takes our dogged commitment. And that's where you come in. If you want leaders that unite our country instead of divide it, if you want leaders who are honest instead of corrupt, if you want leaders who listen to the people instead of listening to their closed circle of lobbyists, if you want leaders who want children in better classrooms instead of better cages, if you want an America that can move forward and progress instead of go backward the way that we're headed now, then this is what I want you to do. Don't waste a minute of your time feeling daunted that Donald Trump has a base of diehard supporters. So did Richard Nixon before he resigned. So did Roy Moore before he lost. And so will Donald Trump before he loses as well. Instead, instead, I want you to work hard to reach, to register, 
and to mobilize the strong majority of Americans who want change right now in 2018. And the thing is that I know in so many ways that I'm preaching to the choir. I bet that there are a lot of days when the folks in this room, when you feel like, why in the world am I doing this again? When you get another call to go volunteer at the campaign office, or you get one of those emails, or maybe a hundred of those emails right before the deadline to contribute, or you call one of your friends and they won't answer anymore because they know why you're calling. Or you get defriended on Facebook, or blocked on Twitter for being too political. Or when you go block walking, and you come up to a door, you knock on the door, nobody answers. So you knock again, and through the corner of your eye, you see the curtains move. <laughs> How many of y'all have had that happen to you? <laughs> Sometimes you can ask yourself, why am I doing this? It's at those moments that I hope you'll remember that we're doing this because we know that we live in an awesome and great country. But we also live in a country that can be better, that can be more equal, that can be more inclusive, that can be more prosperous for every single individual. And if we all reach out and we register and we mobilize, as you heard folks exhort you during this conference, if we all do our part, then Stacey Abrams is going to be the new governor of Georgia. Paulette Jordan is going to be the new governor of Idaho. David Garcia is going to be the new governor of Arizona. Andrew Gillum is going to be the new governor of Florida. Alejandria and Tim and her colleagues are going to take back the House of Representatives. Beto and his colleagues are going to take back the Senate. And in a couple of years, we're going to send Donald Trump into retirement. Thank you very much. You can make progress happen. We're counting on you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it also means that no one is above the law, on the table for their family. And it also means that no one is above the law. And it also means that no one is above the law. And it also means that no one is above the law. And it also means that no one is above the law. And it also means that no one is above the law. And it also means that no one is above the law. And it also means that no one is above the law. And it also means that no one is above the law. And it also means